Okay. All right, so we are live or we're recording here in on a, a nice May day and we're starting with our homegrown stories episode nine and this is basically for those who have not tuned in before it's about uh, kind of highlighting different North Dakotans and helping people understand why all of us are so committed to our state and why we fall in love with North Dakota. So today it's my honor to uh, have a, a chat with Josh Boshi. He is over in the Fargo area, but he is also uh, one of our representatives here in North Dakota. And that's how I first met him. And so that's how I only know him. And so I actually don't know that much about him. So I am excited to dig in deep to where he came from and how he got here. So um, Josh, welcome. Dr. Shelley, great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, okay. So we're just gonna start out with, tell us about yourself and your family. Where were you born? where did you come from? Your everything. And just yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just coming off uh, celebrating my 38th birthday. So oh, 38 uh, trips around the sun here in North Dakota. Um, I grew up in Minot, so North Central North Dakota. Um, went to school there with my, you know, my, grew up with my family there. All my family is primarily still there. Um, grew up with uh, uh, my mom's a nurse and she's over at Trinity uh, Hospital over yeah. there. Uh, my dad works in construction, helps build roads and infrastructure, and he still does that. Uh, and I'm the middle of three boys. So my older brother, Boyd, uh, lives at home with my parents. He has uh, physical and, and behavioral disabilities, so he lives at home with them. Uh -huh. um, and then my younger brother uh, works in the oil industry. He works on a, a pipeline, uh, monitors uh, uh, that out in Western North Dakota, so does the seven days on, seven days off type oh. thing. So yes. yeah. That's, yeah. that's my family, um, but okay, I, you know, so wait a minute. So what is Boshi? Where does that come from? What, is that French? It, well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> we found it's a couple different things. So yes, we're Germans from Russia. Oh, okay. Um, but then um, from the French part uh, that a lot of the bread, you know, Germans from Russia um, that have moved to North Dakota. So I'm gonna say the word wrong, but I'll say uh, the part that starts with the A. Um, I'll say slurring. Yes, thank you. I'll there you story. go. Oh, that's where my family's from. Oh, really? They're like brother and sister. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> One degree of separation. Yeah, and my yeah. grandpa was the young, uh, you know, had several siblings, and um, he's no longer living, but he, when, when he went off to the Navy and then came back, um, it's my understanding he really didn't stay in touch with his family much, and so we really didn't get to know his family until closer to his death, and, and my dad's been trying to build those relationships and trace uh, in folks. But what we've learned is that there was two Boshis that came over on the ship. Uh, so we're part of one vein, and then there's another vein. Okay. Uh, and everywhere you go in North Dakota, they a lot of times they're teachers or coaches, I've learned. So, awesome. Well, yeah. you've been coaching me quite a bit, so it must be running in your blood. <laughs> so your grandparents were the first ones that came to North Dakota then, or your great-grandparents? It would be my great-grandparents, correct. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. On my okay. dad's side, yeah. Okay, so you grew up in Minot. What was that like? Because Minot wasn't that big of a town when you were younger, right? Correct, yeah. It uh, was you know, always the number, about 35,000 people we talked about, um, but we have the airbase there. So a lot of our identity was on the airbase and supporting the families that served in their military. And so you know, kids I went to school with, they'd be there for two or three years and then go somewhere else and come from somewhere else. And, so, uh, you know, kind of transient that way. But what was always nice about Minot was as a military community, there was so many people who, when they retired, moved back to Minot because they had such great experiences yeah. when they lived there um, yeah. at the air base. So, so, yeah, so, you know, we they have the air base and then um, certainly a lot of agriculture around the area. I come from a family that agriculture is not part of who we are. And so, I never made that connection until I went to NDSU and went back to Minot and realized, oh, there are people in cowboy boots, or there's a lot of agriculture in here that I didn't recognize before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, of you course, you know, you guys were different. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I didn't know it. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, you know, as most folks know, Minot's right on the edge of the box. And so, a lot of growth happened with uh, the energy industry. And, and as I said, that's what my brother works in. And, 
Yeah. Yeah. So Minot's kind of been one of those towns, I think, that kind of ebbs and flows with different industries that come into the state. And, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I loved having hills. I live in Fargo now. It's pretty flat. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 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 And so, um, so would you consider yourself a town kid then? You know, out here it's like yeah. town kid. And so you're a town kid. Okay. Absolutely. So then, and so, but you, uh, but you still grew up in that small town. Like did everybody, well, you said it was pretty transient a little bit, but was it pretty, um, did everybody kind of know who was who and, and everything, right? Or Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone kind of knew everyone. And, and um, you know, I went to church with my grandma every Saturday at St. Okay. John's uh, down the hill from where we lived. And, and so, you know, all those families and then they all, you know, um, I went to the private, I went to Bishop Ryan high school. So I didn't go to the public school for okay. high school. Um, so I had a smaller class, so it felt like a smaller town. Yeah. Um, but mine at high, my, my friends, they are graduated with several hundred people in their class. We graduated with 60. So okay. I feel like I had the best of both worlds. You know, I got that small class B school atmosphere, uh, but got to be in one of the big cities in North Dakota. Right. Okay. So that is cool. And so, um, because I keep forgetting you're from Minot, because I keep thinking of you as <laughs> Fargo. <laughs> Fargo. So how did you end up in Fargo? Yeah, I ended up uh, in Fargo uh, to go to NDSU. Uh, my cousin um, played football for the Bison. Luke Samuel okay. is his name. Um, and so going to college was always just known. Like, I, I think back and I try to think of um, those kind of developmental conversations with my family about going to college and I can't remember them. I just always knew we were going to go to college. Was, okay. So I think it was just kind of assumed. And so uh, Luke played football and we'd go to his games every fall. And that's how I chose NDSU. You know, my mom wanted, made me apply to two other colleges. Um, mm -hmm. So I applied to, to those schools, but still went to NDSU and, and I've called Fargo home since 2000. So okay. actually uh, just a couple of years ago, I've lived in Fargo longer than I ever lived in Minot. So it's that tipping point. Okay a couple of years ago. And when so. you moved to Fargo, was it kind of that um, Steve Martin, uh, like, like, did you find like, oh, I found my people. <laughs> like, did you fit like <laughs> love? Like, I know the first time when I moved to a city, I was just like, oh, but like, how did you feel coming from this small town out here into a big city? Into the big city? You know, I don't remember thinking it was any different. You know, we okay. spent a lot of time in Fargo growing up. My uh, aunt, uncle, and my godparents live here. Okay. Um, and so, actually, I went to NDSU to be a veterinarian. I don't know if I shared that with you. I, that's yeah. right, now I remember. Yeah, yeah, so my uncle, uh, my godfather and my uncle owned one of the vet hospitals. And so we would, as cousins, all take turns coming to Fargo for a week. Uh, they have horses in South Fargo, and then the clinics we'd go and observe okay. and, and whatnot. So. Yeah, that's what I was going to go to school for. Um, and then kind of in the first week, I realized that's a lot of sciences. Um, <laughs> and I'm not necessarily, a, you know, that focused of a student that sciences would have worked well for me. So, um, so I switched my major into a couple different things. And um, I would say that I was good at college. I wasn't necessarily a good student. Uh, <laughs> I was a trainer, was involved in my fraternity, uh, did orientation, was an RA, student government oh. leader. Yeah. all types of different things and so I, I was active and that was really a lot of my education right I, I always say like education is a is a discipline of thought and it's really just finding your joys and like it, I, I'm glad you were an RA too that was uh, my brother was one of those too so yeah. um so that must be how you decided to run for office so that was just like a I, this is a big jump now like did mm -hmm. that lead you how did you decide to get into government then yeah, no. Well, interesting enough, what my major, I graduated in political science, oh, okay. but I was not politically involved at all at that time. I picked it because I was involved in student government and I didn't know what else I was going to study. And um, so I did not get involved in politics until, see, I graduated in 03, so 2008, so five years later. Um, and so my, a lot of my foundations in, in policy or, or in understanding how government works is based around social justice issues. Um, I was graduating in DSU and got involved with our, our anti-racism team. Um, I got involved in LGBT organizing and so uh -huh. forth. And so I worked at the university after graduating, had a great job there working with students and helping them with student activities and leadership uh, programs. And then it wasn't until 2008 
uh, that I read then, you know, Senator Obama's uh, book, Audacity of Hope. And I was like, well, who's this guy? I got to get to know him. And really? they were hiring staff in the state. And so I quit my job and went what? with them on the campaign. And yeah, so that wow. was my introduction. Wow. <laughs> you were all in. Okay. Yeah, yeah it was okay. quite a leap. So. Yeah, well, and I like it when it happens through inspiration, right? It's always finding those joys in your talents. And obviously, you're a very talented legislator and, and uh, mentor. Um, Thank you. So, so, so you won your race, mm -hmm. and now you're a legislator, and now you're representing the people. Now it's not just about ideas. Now it's right. getting it into the real world. So um, tell us about that. Like, like what was that experience like like everybody wants to change the world right and now you're in that you're a lawmaker you're an actual lawmaker what do you do <laughs> well you know you bring up a great point point. Uh, and i tell anyone i talk to when they're running for office I, I remember explicitly three weeks out from my first election because that's when it hit me that's when it was like this oh crap moment of i might win what happens <laughs> if i win you know, it, it isn't just ideas then. I mean, it's ideas and then bringing people along with you. So um, yeah, I've taken that very seriously. And, and that's part of what informs me and in being the legislator I am is, it's not about me, it's about the people I represent. And, and so I try really hard to stay engaged. Um, you know, whether it's during session or outside of session, we do a lot on social media. Uh, we try to host forums on a regular basis to get input from people. Um, I, I think it's the the weirdest thing for me when I respond to an email from a constituent and their response back is, thank you for responding to my email. You're one of the first people ever to. And I was like, well, that's my job. Like, well, that's the bare minimum of my job is to <laughs> acknowledge that you've reached out to me and had an idea whether we agree with it or not. Yeah. It still has helped inform me um, in the decisions I make uh, in the legislature. And so. Yeah, yeah, so I'm proud of that level of engagement, and, and that's yeah. what really drives me about being a legislator, is being a voice for folks who aren't at that table. Well, and even just, I, I agree with that voter that, uh, or your, your constituent that said, wow, oh, you talked back to me. Like, you think that they're like in this different realm, and they're working for you, and they can't work right. for you without knowing what, what it, it's just, it's a weird thing to think about for us, but it's obvious that's your job and but not everybody is like that and so that's why right. a lot of us just we just feel like we're shouting in the wind a lot of times but um so thank you for being an engaged legislator it means a lot thank <laughs> so, you. so yeah so what was your biggest surprise is, uh, about serving in the legislature um biggest surprise i don't i don't know if i had surprises what i really enjoy is i feel like i'm going to class every day you know yeah. There's there's 141 of us legislators. We have 80 days every two years to get a lot of work done, and I'm expected in one day to vote on health care, child care, education, you know, yeah. egg conservation policies, how we're going to fund higher ed, and I none of us should be can be expected to do all that, and we don't have <laughs> staff to also help us right. with that. That are experts, so we depend on each other, and and I really enjoy. The, the committee hearings, because again, that's where the voters, that's where the constituents are coming in and talking about, you know, why is it important that we do X, Y, Z, or why we shouldn't do X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I tell folks the hardest part of the day is pushing the button, because the minute I push yes or no on that button, I know I have to be able to answer when someone asks, why did you push it that way? Yep. It's not just an easy thing I do and I throw it away and I'm gone and, right. and move on to the next thing. It that has an impact, and and I take yeah. that seriously. And and yeah, you know. So I, I'm yeah. really glad you bring that up because I I don't think we you know we always get angry at our legislators and stuff you know because we want somebody to blame. But the the seriousness of pushing that button, you know, you're going to affect lives, good for the good or for the bad, right at that moment. And that's, that's a big responsibility. So. Absolutely. And again, at a time where in 80 days, we have to make a lot of big decisions. Yeah. And my background was in education. I've had to learn a lot about healthcare or about, uh, you know, how we build roads or our healthcare delivery system. And, you know, so it's, uh, you know, fortunate we have a lot of great folks in the state of North Dakota, some dedicated employees yeah. 
um, that can help inform us as policymakers. Yeah. And, and I hope my colleagues listen to these folks because it's not about an agenda, it's about their work and how they deliver and take care of North Dakota. Yeah, and just for, for my, our friends that are outside of North Dakota, I think um, we are kind of, I don't think we're completely unique, but I think it's our legislators also continue to do their full-time jobs, right? And so that's not that common, I guess, but that's kind of, in a way I like it because that means you're still us, yes. right? And you're still back in the community, but on the other hand, 80 days is a lot to run a whole state. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I like it too. You know, we, a lot of our colleagues from the country are citizen legislators, but they also are full-time legislators and full-time whatever else they do. Here, I'm there for 80 days, do intense work. Then I go home and I work at my real estate company that I'm at. I still have commitments as a, as a legislator, but I'm doing them at home. I'm not doing it at Bismarck. I go to yeah, Bismarck for short periods and I come home and I get to go to school plays and, and see my neighbors walking around the neighborhood and, you know, get to know, again, the issues that are important to them and, right. and, and the faces behind those emails and those phone calls of who those folks are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't have yeah. it any other way. I, I do think we need to create more flexibility in how we legislate. So whether it's more days spread out over the two right. years instead of at once, but yeah. I would not want to go to a full-time legislator. Right, I, I agree. I think I, I think I, I feel that that's what a lot of North Dakotans feel right. too. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so um, so that's really cool. So good, and you are running this year again. So I good luck on your race. I, I hope you, you continue to represent us as well as you have. And, um, and yeah, folks in North Fargo get to vote for both of us. So I encourage them to do yes, that. Yes, yes, I know. Yes. I'm running for governor, and I, I am, uh, you know, but this is about you. But uh, hopefully, we get to work together. But, Absolutely. you know, um, I know that you would work together with anybody. So mm -hmm. that's the important role of the legislators, right? <laughs> right. So, okay. So, um, so, you know, what is, you've done amazing things already, uh, transforming your state, uh, lifting the voice of um, people that, whose voices need to be lifted. So you're kind of a hero to a lot of us, but what is the one thing on your bucket list that you hope to cross off soon? So you've done a lot already and I know you're building a deck. So that's almost done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That, um, you know, it's an interesting question for me because I realize that I don't necessarily set goals and work towards them. Like I just kind of live in the moment and do what needs to be done then. So, which is interesting too, because I'm a planner too. Like if you ask me what I'm doing next Tuesday at four o'clock, I can tell you because it's in my calendar and there's already a plan for it. But so as far as a bucket list item, I don't, it's hard because, you know, I could flippantly say world peace or I could say, you know, I'm going to. We're working know, on that. <laughs> mobile on, yeah, things like that. So for me, I, you know, I guess, I don't know. I, you know, I, <laughs> I try There's to. There's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of freedom in that. And that's what I would say. I say, you're already living your best life. And that's right. why you're so good at it. That's what I would say. There's no, there's no want. I always say people. You know, of course, we're not the richest in the world, but we are because we have enough. Right. For and many that of us, yeah. richer than the richest people that just keep, you know, wanting more. Yeah. So I think that that is a perfect, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're living your best life. There's no Thanks. want in your life. That's a better service, better service. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we're, we're getting uh, close to the end here and this is uh, what I always ask about because it always speaks, as soon as whoever says whatever, uh, it, every, every single North Dakotan knows exactly what you're talking about. But for you, what is your favorite thing about North Dakota? Oh, yeah. Um, it's the people. Um, I just love, I love the fact that, you know, we're, it's, we're one big town with long roads. You know, right. there's connections. You know, I, you and I in the last 25 minutes made how many connections about whether we're, you know, from, you know, the same part of Germany, yeah, Russia, and, you know, <laughs> had a similar interest in, in professions. Um, but yeah, so it's, you know, I think a lot of times people will ask someone like me who's, a, you know, a fairly progressive person who's in policy making, why don't you just go to Minnesota? Why don't you just move to Denver? And, you know, for me and my partner, it, this is our home. 
our families are here. You know, we shouldn't have to leave to have the life that we want for us and for our friends and family. And so I just love the fact that there's such great people um, throughout the state. I think we're hardworking people. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we do take care of one another. Um, and I just would like to see some of that reflected more in our policies of it shouldn't just be expected on our neighbors to take care of it. it we should all just take care of each other. And, and that way we can lift all boats with the tide. And, you know, yeah. I think this public health crisis has really shown kind of a great equalizer for folks in terms of it impacts us all, whether we own a business or we work for a business, whether we're in healthcare or need healthcare, you know, it's, yeah. we're all kind of getting leveled and there's certain folks that are feeling it much more than others, but how do we come out of this and look to how can we be a better service-minded state that can take care of our people be a place that other people want to move to because they see how well we take care of our citizens whether that's child care or long-term care and everything in between yeah. um, there's just a lot care. of opportunities <laughs> exactly yeah. well i love how you say that because um you know one thing about our extreme climate that that i always call is uh, is our equalizer and so it doesn't matter if you are it doesn't matter who you are. If you're stuck in a, in a drift, in a snow drift, somebody's going to go by, they're going to have a tow rope and they're going to pull you out. But blizzards only last, you know, a week or so. But this is lasting long enough that maybe the whole, it's going to be like a longer lasting kind of blizzard <laughs> yeah. where we have that, that sense of uh, sharing and stuff like that. And so I agree with you. And th there's just, um, there's nothing, it's just this connection and it's hard to like, explain to people outside what it's like unless you are here <laughs> living yeah yeah well and i think you know there's been plenty of visitors who become residents people who come here for a work conference and get to experience how beautiful people are and the beautiful you know environment around us yeah. um and 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 that draws them in and and yeah. you know i just hope again that um we can be uh, the, the divisiveness that we're experiencing as a nation, you know, we're starting to see, I think, it come to the middle of the country as well and be yeah. a little bit more prevalent. And I, I hope that we can push back against that and be, um, uh, you know, a state that takes care of people again and, and focuses on our gifts and our talents versus what makes us different. Yeah, we'll find it. We'll find yeah. it. Josh, I want to thank you. Thank you, one, for being a mentor. Thank you too for helping us lift all boats. You've been working hard. It's not a glamorous job. Thank you. <laughs> and good luck on your race. And um, thanks for sharing your, your story with us. I love thanks. it. Thanks. Yes. Well, and I appreciate the time together, Dr. Shelley. And yeah. you and Ben keep up the great work. And we'll be in touch soon. Okay. All right.